This is part four in a series of videos in which I'm attempting to explain uh, how to set up and use a logic analyzer such as the Agilent 1672G that I have here. Uh, this information hopefully applies to many different types of analyzer, um, but in particular the uh, trigger uh, functions within the Agilent are extremely powerful and that's really what the main focus of these videos will be from this point forward. In the previous videos I showed how to do the very basic setup of the analyzer, uh, how to connect it to a target board. I've got a very simple target board here that's just a 16-bit counter, a clock and a ROM. Uh, the ROM has a few bytes of data uh, set at a specific address and that's what we're using for the uh, demonstration. I'm doing this to avoid the complications in trying to explain how a real world target uh, system might work. This just gives us far more control over what we're looking at so we can focus on the functions of the analyzer. Okay, so I'll get the camera moved, I'll get the analyzer powered up, I'll load our standard configuration and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so I, we have our configuration loaded. This is what we had in the previous videos. In this video I want to look at the use of symbols, labels and how to time events. So one of the things with an analyzer like this is it has some quirks or features that it's best to make use of rather than trying to fight. If you try fighting against it it makes it very difficult to use and hopefully what I mean by that will become clearer as we progress through this video. So the first thing I'm going to do is clear the existing trigger, so this is what was left from our previous uh, testing. So we'll just clear trigger completely. So we start off with the default trigger. Notice it all, it clears everything including the uh, values in the terms. And what we'll do now is we'll create a symbol that we can make use of. So we'll go to symbols, which is in the format menu, press select, we'll now load our symbols and if you recall we had a couple that we'd created and also if you remember the data in the ROM that we want to look at was mapped from uh, address 8000 up to 8004 so that's what I'm going to set this symbol for so anytime we now refer to ROM1 uh, as a symbol then we're really talking about this range of uh, addresses and also you recall that I set the symbol width to 16. Um, I'll come back to that later. It, it's not the bit width, it's not the size of the variable, it's actually just the number of characters in the symbol name, but as I say I'll come back to that later. And if you want to create symbols for uh, other uh, inputs, then what you do is you select them from the list, and this list will just contain any that you have defined. In this case if we want to create a symbol for uh, chip enable, we can do that and uh, all we do is give it a name so we'll call it uh, ROM chip enable and it's active low so we can now use this uh, symbol anywhere we want and uh, again we'll come back to symbols later uh, but just bear in mind that uh, the symbol that we've created on the address bus uh, ROM1 is for the range of addresses that contain the data that we're interested in. Okay, so although we're uh, counting through the test board incrementally, just uh, bear in mind that that doesn't really matter as far as the system's concerned. We can look at this range of addresses as if though it was a function within firmware. And so that's what uh, we're going to do. We're going to assume that um, those bytes are actually a function within the ROM, and that's what we're interested in looking at. So if we go back to trigger, I want to effectively reproduce what we did in the previous video but using a more intuitive symbolic form. So if we go to trigger and I want to first start by adding a, another state. So we go to the state after the one we want to add the new level to. Click on insert, before and we'll select the standard user level. So what we have now are three levels within our sequence. So we go back to the first one, and if you remember, we want to 
uh, not store anything while we're waiting for the trigger uh, to start. So no state and we want to trigger on A. So we'll now create the terms we want to use to trigger. And we'll now change the name of these to make it clearer. So if you select the term you want to use, go up to rename, and we will call this ROM1. Doesn't matter, it's got the same name as the symbol. And what we can do now, notice also it changes in the uh, sequence. And what we want to do now is change the address so we're using symbols and what we can now do is select the ROM term and in this case we are going to select ROM1 from the symbol table that we've uh, produced with an offset of zero. So if we now go back to the sequence, the first step it's saying we'll store nothing while we're waiting to trigger on ROM1. So ROM1 being any address within that uh, symbol range that we set. And we can leave uh, else on no state go to 1, that's fine as it is. Now the next one, we want to store data while we are in the ROM1 address range or while we're in that function. So we want to store any state. Um, that would work, but it's better if we actually go to ROM1 and that will make sure that we're only storing data within that range. And we then want to find the uh, exit point for this. And so we can come back here. Now this is what I meant about not fighting the machine. If we want to create an exit point, if you like, for that uh, particular level within the sequence, we'll use B, uh, we'll rename it and we'll call it uh, ROM one end and we can now set a value and so if we go in here and select uh, an absolute value so we know that the last byte uh, is at a value of 8004 but notice what happens if I enter 8004 it's not saying absolute 8004 what it's saying is ROM1 plus 0004 so the analyzer is smart enough to be able to tell you that address that you've just entered is actually um, four bytes above the start of ROM1 and we can now make use of that in our sequence so we want to exit when we hit ROM1 end We also want to uh, exit if we uh, exceed the range of values. So if we go outside the range, then we want to exit. And uh, in this case, I'm going to leave this uh, as it is, simply because uh, this will be useful for us later on when we try doing something a bit more complex. I'm going to leave that as it is for now. And if we can then come down to the last state, I don't want to store anything at all, so we store no states. And that's it for the initial configuration. What we can now do is go to waveform, arm the analyzer, but notice that we're only capturing two values here. We're capturing the first value and the last value. If we go back to trigger, that is because we've got this uh, else on set to no state. If we change this to any state and then recapture, it's now capturing the entire range of addresses. If we go to the list view, you'll see that we're capturing exactly what we want. We can make use of this um, if we want to, which we'll come back to shortly. Before I do that, um, notice here that uh, we're showing you can, you can uh, set symbols or um, the base value for uh, each term that you want. And if we change the address to symbol, notice we've got this wide field and it's actually 16 characters wide. And the reason that's 16 characters wide, of course, is because in our symbol table, we set the address to 16 characters. And that's what it does, it sets the number of uh, uh, characters. So if we set it to 2 for example, 
and then go back to the list view notice now that it's only saying RO which is the first two letters in our ROM1 symbol uh, and then you've got the, um, the offset for each individual byte so that's what that value is for it just lets you set the uh, the width the number of characters in the symbol I normally set it to 16 for addresses because I tend to want to have fairly uh, informative uh, values but notice that when you change it it doesn't actually change the symbols it doesn't delete the characters it just changes the number of characters that are displayed so if we go back to list notice we've now got back to our uh, wider range and uh, you can do that for all of them so uh, for example with the chip enable you remember we set a symbol for that it was only eight characters wide um, but again you can adjust the width of that field as well okay so back to trigger now we've so far triggered on what we wanted to and what we want to do now is look at how to time if we assume that those five bytes are a function uh, or a subroutine uh, in the ROM and we want to time how long it takes the subroutine to uh, execute we can do that fairly easily all we need to do is set the timer on the trigger so if we go back to trigger now this is not to be confused with the timer term or the timer uh, macro this is a different thing um, but what we do is come down to this where it says count and set it to time if you now come back to list notice we now have this time relative field at the end time and it's currently set to relative if we rerun and recapture we now have um, the uh, relative time between each of these captures uh, it might be useful if you want to do that and it's quite useful if the function has uh, calls to other subroutines um, but in this case what I'm going to do is change it to absolute and it now shows us the time that it's it's kind of uh, racking up as it goes through these uh, individual bytes as it uh, accesses them so we can now see how long we would be in that function call but the problem is uh, that firstly a lot of functions are much longer than five bytes so it's, it can be a bit of a nuisance having to go right through the entire function uh, but also if the function calls other functions or other subroutines then if, because they're outside of the range that we're capturing so in this case we're only capturing data that's within ROM1 uh, it means that this would be incorrect because it wouldn't be capturing data outside of that range so the timing would be uh, incorrect um, but if you recall when we had this set to no state then it only captured the first and the last bytes so let's we go back to the list it's only capturing the first and last bytes of that address range so even if it uh, if the function called other subroutines and they called other subroutines we're really timing between accesses to these two addresses and that means we're timing how long we're in this function irrespective of uh, whether that, that function calls other functions or has variable delays or whatever else it will show you the time between the two events so that's the first address and the last address okay if we go back to trigger and we change this back to any state then we're once again capturing all the bytes now another way we could go about this is to create a range of uh, addresses if we go down the terms to range 1 and again we can rename this if we want to so if we change the name and um, we'll call it ROM this, kind of, this time we'll put a space in there just to uh, be clear ROM1 and we want to set the uh, range of addresses within that uh, function so the high address is 8004 
notice again it's smart enough to know that that's actually um, an address that's ROM 1 start plus 4 so this is what I meant about not fighting the machine is don't try to force it to, to do something it doesn't want to it's trying to help and there isn't really a sensible way to stop it doing this you can stop it doing it but um, it's easier just to um, make use of this it can be quite useful when you're reverse engineering software because it tells you something that you may not have uh, already realized and um, again start address is 8000 and once again it's given us the correct offset so what we can now do is come back up here and say uh, right we want to save nothing store nothing until we get within the range of ROM1 so when we're in ROM1 saying ROM1 down here because it used to say range uh, in range 1 and out range 1 but then we've changed the uh, label so it's now showing what we've entered okay and then in our second level we want to uh, store in ROM1 until we are no longer in ROM 1. If we go back and capture, notice now we're getting one extra byte on the end, so we're getting this uh, space on the end. And if you recall, the reason it does that is because we have um, this option set by default, branches taken are stored. If we set that to off and then go back to waveform and recapture. It's now under capturing the data that we want it to. So that's another way you can do the same thing. We're getting exactly the same timing. It's just showing us the uh, labels uh, in a slightly different way. But uh, you can see that this is a, a very informative way of setting up the triggers. It tells you uh, much more than just entering addresses. So uh, we're getting in ROM1, out ROM1. It's far more informative than uh, setting addresses or uh, a or B or whatever else. Uh, there are other, other ways of doing this. If you look at the trigger menus for example uh, you can see that not only do you have things like C uh, but you also have uh, not equal to C. So there are many different options in here and it's really going through and thinking about fundamentally uh, how they work and um, the main thing is just to remember what this structure is what these these three boxes represent and once you've kind of got the hang of this then the entire analyzer becomes much easier to use that's why i'm kind of going over this multiple times because this is really the key to using these analyzers once you get the meaning and the real purpose and power of these individual steps then you can pr create pretty much any uh, sequence that you want and it does get increasingly powerful and you almost end up with a, a pseudo code that you've set. Once you've done all this of course it can take time so remember that you can at any time come back into your system and save what you've created, what um, configuration you've made and as I said before I tend to only store the uh, setup and not the data but you can store data if you want to. Uh, and then this uh, setup will be available the next time you load. You can configure the analyzer to automatically load a configuration. Um, and what I do, as I say, is have a separate directory for each project I'm working on. Even if they're the same machine, I might want different configurations. So uh, you can, of course, save different configurations within the same directory. So you might have four or five different projects in each directory, depending on uh, what aspect of the machine you're working on. Uh, okay, so that's it for this uh, video. Now, hopefully you're finding these uh, interesting or useful. If you want me to cover anything in particular, then please leave a comment. Uh, I'll go through this uh, relatively slowly. Hopefully it won't be too boring for you. But if you're not interested in this, then just uh, skip the video.